In the beginning of time, the great creator reason made the earth a common treasury, but not one word was spoken in the beginning that one branch of mankind should rule over another. Now that's a statement by, from a pamphlet uh, written by Gerard Winstanley. The true levelers, and I, I thought the true levelers meant like the real levelers, but it doesn't really mean that. Apparently, as I looked into it, the true probably means, the true level was probably Jesus Christ. So it probably means that they're, that they're the follow, they're true followers of Christ, probably that's what it means, rather than the better levelers than the other levelers that John's going to talk a lot more about. Um, and he also said in a later pamphlet, I also catch a declaration from the poor oppressed people of England that the earth was not made purposely for you to be lords of it, and that we to be your slaves and servants and beggars, that it, was, that it was made to be a common livelihood to all with respect of persons, and that your buying and selling of land and the fruits of it one to another is the cursed thing that, uh, and was brought in by war, which hath and still does establish murder and theft. So you can see that uh, what you have obviously with um, with Winstanley, you can see those communist and socialistic ideas that he, that he expressed. I'll come back to him in a minute because I thought I'd start today rather than rather than uh, rather than then. And I was going to start with the general the general election on the face of it, a contest in England between the Tories and Labour, between two different kinds of Englishmen in Johnson and Corbyn. You know, one's the Eton Oxford great libertarian imperialist unionist etc british patriots and all those other things and then you have jeremy who's a uh, pacifist or peace loving republican internationalist and anti-imperialist now i'm not going to go into the circumstances prior to the election but um to, to say that um it's an election between english nationalism on one hand and english republicanism on the other seems maybe a bit strange to say certainly Johnson and English nationalism you can make a connection but can you make a connection between Jeremy Corbyn as the leader of English republicanism and possibly it's a statement of English irony so perhaps I'm being ironic if I say that and if you want to find out uh, about English irony then you just need to consult the Palestinian ambassador to get the, get the full definition of that one but anyway recently when Johnson was being challenged about the use of uh, use of his powers um, in the Commons by some Tories who are getting a bit worried about it, he says the following things. There's an important difference between our country and many other countries around the world, and that is if you look at history of this country over the last 300 years, virtually every advance from free speech to democracy has come from this country, and it's very difficult to ask the British population to uniformly obey these guidelines, the ones I've just given over coronavirus, in a way that is necessary, he says. So he's calling up, he's calling up history to justify the presence. And that's the sort of thing that comes about in a crisis. Well, of course, 300 years takes us back to 1720, which seems about right because that's after the Glorious Revolution, it's after the 1707 Act of Union, and it's even after the defeat of the, of the Jacobite uprising. And it's the point when the new crown is consolidating its power. But if you were to go to the Republican, Republican Corbyn, you'd have to go back another three, you'd have to go back 371 years to 1649. And um, Corbyn said, as he said in 2017, yeah, I, you know, I'm a Republican. That's what, what he said in the statement. And there was an interesting, I just, an interesting review by David Horspool, the historian. He says, Jeremy Corbyn is taking Labour back to the 1640s. And he was reviewing John Rees's book on the level of revolution for the spectator. He says, Jeremy will probably enjoy this book because John Lilburn, leader of the levelers, is an historical figure Corbyn most admired. The levelers had a radical dem democratizing politics, which he says sporadically, and I think it's important, sporadically appears on the left. So he's making the connection between Corbyn, and you could certainly make it through Tony Benn back to, back, to, back to that time. And obviously, go away and read John's book, and I'm sure we'll have to we've, we've listen to what he has to say, which, is a, which covers this period fantastically well. So, 
1649, I'm not going to really go back before that, and probably John will, but the year 1649 is a year of revolution and counter-revolution. It's in many ways the high watermark of the English Revolution, but it's also the year of defeat, where the revolution meets the counter-revolution and the counter-revolution wins. So whilst Johnson's talking about the glorious epoch after 1688, we're living in the historical epoch of counter-revolution of a defeat, which is three which we suffered 371 years ago. And of course, on January the 4th, 1649, the House of Commons declared that England was now a Commonwealth. And we know that King Charles was executed on the 30th of January. And on the 1st of February, the Commons passed motion saying that the, the House of Lords was going to be abolished because it was useless and dangerous. I think that's a pretty good description. And on the 7th of February, the House passed another motion saying that the office of king in this nation is unnecessary, burdensome, dangerous to the liberty, safety, and public interests of the people of this nation, and therefore ought to be abolished. And they then did so on the 17th and 19th of March. So if we had a Republic Day, it would be the 19th of March, in my, in my opinion. And so the highest achievement that we, we've had, and we haven't really passed it to this day, is that, we, that this country, England, abolished the monarchy, abolished the House of Lords, and in the agreement of the people, that no doubt John will say a lot more about, we had, well, I would say a written constitution, nearly a written constitution, because it never quite got passed, but anyway, a written constitution was intended to be put to the people for a democratic endorsement and agreement. Um, it, never quite made, it never quite made it. I think it was put to the Commons of about three versions of it. I think the second one was put to the Commons in January and then there was this other version on the 1st of May 1649 when the levelers, uh, leveler leaders were in prison. <clears throat> uh, what did the Commonwealth mean? Well, of course it meant a republic, but I think it also had this other idea, which is the roots of the idea of a commonweal or the public good which perhaps linked wealth and well-being and wealth to the welfare of the people. So I think it was more than it was a republic, but I think it had the idea that it was about the welfare of the common people. And the leaders of the diggers, Winston and Son, expressed this idea of a true commonwealth, saying that um, it was the people would either have to establish the commonwealth's freedom by making provision for everyone's peace, which is righteous or we would have a restoration, or we'd end up with a restoration. So I don't think we ever kind of re achieved the social republic. I think there's more to be gone, but, uh, but there was, there was, a, there was a, a beginning of going in that direction. The position, the situation in 1649 was, um, I suppose you could call it a, bo a, 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 bo a bowling, bowling, boil, boiling, I'll have that, a boiling cauldron. The remnants of the Royalist armies, there were Royalist plots, there were uprisings in Kent, Yorkshire and Wales, bad harvest, high food prices, and uh, the phrase, the world was turned upside down. The political power was very um, uncertain who, who was in, 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 in charge. So into that vacuum of turmoil and disruption, we have the idea that there was a complete relaxation during the war of uh, um, and there was confidence gained by ordinary people from their actions during the war that led them to be engaged in these radical activities. So as in all revolutions, people believe that any, every, anything is possible and people and individuals want to do much more radical things. Many preconceptions and ideas are swept away in that process um, and things become clear, much clearer. And so on the 1st of April, 1649, um, a group of dissenting soldiers invaded a church at Walton-on-Thames and just down the road at St George's Hill, a group of diggers occupied the land and began their cooperative farming. The two leaders, Winstanley and led by Winstanley and Everard, so it was a direct action movement by occupying the land, but it was backed up by quite a strong ideological uh, idea about the nature of society uh, and therefore it's following those ideas put around by uh, of Winstanley, socialistic and communal ideas, you could say godly communism might be another way of describing it. 
and according to some estimates, I don't know, it seems a bit high to me, but according to one estimate, there were a few thousand diggers around England at one time, but I'm not sure if I have a chance to check whether that's true, but that's, that's one estimate I've seen. But there were colonies in Wellingborough, Conhall in Kent, in Iver, Buckinghamshire, in Barnet, in Enfield, in Dunstable, in Bosworth in Leicester, and in Gloucestershire, and in Nottinghamshire. Now, on the 19th of April, um, Thomas Fairfax, the Supreme Commander of the New Model Army, sent a troop of cavalry down to see what the hell was going on. And um, eventually, Winstanley and Everard went to Whitehall to meet Fairfax. To cut a, a long story short, Fairfax decided that they were doing no harm and left it to the local landowners and magistrates to deal with it. Now, of course, they employed violence and general thuggery and vandalism to drive, to drive the, the, uh, the diggers away. And it's sometimes thought that perhaps Fairfax was a reasonable man and saw no, saw no need to do anything. But I think another explanation might simply be at this point of crisis, the idea of using a troop of farmers and craftsmen on horseback to attack poor farmers could have been a problem. Maybe they would have refused to carry out their orders. Maybe they would have been reluctant and spread the, told the rest of their regiment or the army this wasn't what they should be doing because they would have had some sympathy. And the, the original troop that went down there did have some sympathy for the digger. So perhaps uh, Fairfax was just being cautious, pragmatic in a crisis because the army was in a serious crisis in April, May. I'm sure John will tell us a bit more about that. Um, okay, so let's just now make up, just, just draw out some lessons. I want to draw some lessons that I still think are relevant today. I'm going to pick on three lessons from 1649. The first one is the idea of a relationship between republicanism and socialism, or I'd prefer to call it a republican road to socialism. So although the republic never became a true commonwealth, never provided for the welfare of people, it opened the door to exactly the kind of movement that, that, Win that Winstanley and the diggers had. It opened the door to the idea of the socialization of the land, the taking over of the common land and occupying the common land. And that would not have been possible under the Stuart autocracy. It required that revolution, that republic, to allow that sort of development to take place. So that's the first thing. And I think that connection between republicanism and socialism or socialization is one that we can look for elsewhere, not just here. But that's the first connection, I think, between the, with the two of them. Secondly, second point is that the monarchy wasn't abolished by the monarchy. It was the republic that abolished the monarchy. And so in a way, you could think that the Republic of January 1649, the Commonwealth, was a kind of provisional republic that put Charles on, power, on, on trial and executed him and passed laws and abolished the monarchy and abolished the House of Lords. So if you want to establish a democratic system of government, which is quite a big and difficult thing to do, and it, which takes time, it could be months or years, the first step is to have a provisional republic as the first step to go down that road. So you need a republic to get a republic, if that seems a sort of slightly bizarre thing to say. And then I'll make another point, which is about the crown, um, which is this, that the revolution, I think in the 17th century, reshaped the idea of the crown because originally the crown was very much associated with the king. But Winstanley makes two important observations, which I still think are very relevant about the crown, which he calls kingly power. I like quite the idea of kingly power. That is the power that's not just in the hands of the king, not just the king, it can be deployed. You could talk about crown power today, kingly power. He says, at the end of 1640, he says that kingly, kingly power is like a great spread tree. If you lop off the head or the top brow and let the other branches and roots stand, it will grow again and recover fresher strength. The top brow is lopped off the tree of tyranny the oppression is a great tree still and keeps the sun of freedom from, poor common, from the poor common still. He has many branches and great roots which must be grubbed up, must be dug up before everyone can sing Sion's song of peace. In other words, to translate that, republicanism is not just about the king or the queen and simply knocking the head off the, knocking the, 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 the uh, fairy off the Christmas, top of the Christmas tree which many people think that's all it's about. 
it's asking the queen to retire no you have to do something much more radical than that you have to really change the whole way uh, the whole structure of power because if king kingly power will uh, if it's not destroyed and it wasn't destroyed by the execution of charles it will reassert itself it will come back again in some other form and so you need a democratic revolution to pull up the, uh, the roots of that and then the final point is we could uh, Win Stanley sets out the political choices facing the country and in his view there are three options and the first one he says either we're going to establish the commonwealth the commonwealth's freedom in power making provisions for everyone's peace which is righteous the social the social advances for the people or else you must set up a monarchy again he says but then he says monarchy is twofold either for one king to reign that's the monarch or many to reign by kingly promotion it as and if one king rules or many many rule by kingly principles much murmuring grudges trouble and quarrels may and will arise amongst the oppressed people on every gained opportunity now that's an interesting idea because what it says to me is we think the monarchy is one person the monarch but the monarchy could also be an oligarchy who are ruling in the name of the crown and using the kingly powers of the crown. And I think that's what was happening through the 17th century. The crown, the monarchy was being redesigned from being a, the personal power of one person to becoming at the end of the 17th century, an oligarchy where many are ruling through the crown, being redefined, event, redesigned eventually in, in the, in the, through the revolution of 1688. So I think we've got a crown which isn't one person, we've got a crown where the use of kingly powers is carried out by Boris Johnson, etc. And that's what we're seeing. It's the powers of the crown is a thing that we, that we still have, are living with till this day. And we're doing time well, just getting on time. I'm nearly coming to an end, I think, now. Obviously, I won't say that, I think, it, I was going to say, but I won't do it to say what a hugely world historic event this revolution is and how it's connected to the French and the American revolutions. I'm sure that other people will say that i'll perhaps just come maybe to the end then of what i want to say i thought i would come to my conclusion coming back to corbyn what did corbyn say because i started with jeremy so i might as well come back to him corbyn told the new statesman listen he said i'm at heart as you well know a republican but it's not a fight i am i'm going to fight it's not a fight i'm interested in I'm much more interested in rebalancing society, dealing with the problems, protecting the environment, etc., etc. The mirror confirmed this by saying at the same time, J Jeremy Corbyn's real views on the Queen aren't as radical as you think. So I suppose if it was a contest there between Boris Johnson as the English nationalist and Jeremy Corbyn as the English Republican, we know who's going to win that one. It's going to be Boris Johnson. I'll finish there. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Steve. Um, my apologies uh, for the change in chair. Um, my name's Kevin Bean and I was originally scheduled to chair the discussion. I'm afraid I had some technical problems, but I've uh, managed to resolve those now. So thank you, uh, comrades. Um, I'm now going to bring in uh, John Rees, so I don't think needs any introduction at all. And I'm sure comrades are very well aware of his work on the levelers and um, it's a, an important uh, contribution both I think in popularizing and I don't mean that in a, you know, a, a bad way popularizing the importance of the levelers and the revolution movements of the 17th century but I know that he's, he's also done some other doctoral research which I think is, is also uh, a very important contribution in looking at the, the importance of the leveler movement. Um, why I'm very excited a, a, about this uh, tonight's discussion is that I think it is um, the discussion that I'd, I did last week on the Peasants' Revolt, uh, both the German movement and the English movement, talked about, I suppose, some of the, the movements of the masses onto the stage of history, although the, the ideologies were still then very, um, not really very clearly formed. But I think what we're seeing here, both in Steve's introduction about the diggers, and I'm sure in, when John gives his uh, contribution, we're looking at very developed political ideas, particularly ideas of democracy and the, and the rights of the mass of the population to have some sort of political say and some sort of political control. Now, 
the, the nature of that, the nature of level of ideology, um, I, I suppose are still contested. But what, in whatever form, even in its very limited form, it certainly is a cry for, for democracy and in its more radical forms for the, the, common, the, the common ownership of the treasure of the earth. Anyway, I'll, uh, I'll now hand over to, to John. Um, I'll just remind comrades that if you want to ask a question or to make a contribution, there will be a chance at the end of the talks. Um, you can either do that by uh, clicking on the, the blue hand using the participants uh, section or using the question and answer, which I will try to moderate. Okay, John, if you'd uh, like to go ahead now. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks for the invitation. And um, Kevin, thanks very much for that introduction. Um, let, me, let me start here. In January 1649, the English people did something absolutely uh, unique, historically unique, something that had never been done before. They put their king on trial in a public court, found him guilty of treason against the people and then executed him on a scaffolding erected outside the banqueting house where the banqueting house still stands in Westminster. Now in the entirety of human history, in the millennia long uh, existence of human society, there had only been monarchies, kings, or Kaisers, or Caesars, or Shahs. They're all descriptions, all words with the same root. Uh, there have never been any other form of human government. The very idea that a king could be treasonous towards the people, as opposed to citizens being treasonous towards the king, was in itself to have, in the contemporary phrase, turned the world upside down. To execute the king was, in many people's minds, simply uh, unimaginable, uh, simply uh, an incomprehensible uh, thing uh, to do. You have to remember that when the Long Parliament uh, met um, a, a mere eight or nine years earlier, uh, there was perhaps one MP, Henry Martin, a, a leveller ally, as it turned out, um, who was a Republican. Uh, and even his Republicanism was issued in very circumspect terms. He said, uh, I don't believe that one family is wise enough to rule us all. So any idea of Republicanism, let alone of regicide, was almost politically imaginable. The language simply didn't exist. Uh, to describe it. Democracy, the term democracy existed, but it was an insult, universally an insult. The same as saying anarchy or communism would be, uh, would be uh, today. Now, on the scaffold where Charles I was executed in that cold day at the end of January 1649, there were, among others, two men a man called Richard Rumbold, and a man called John Harris. And they were both members of an organization called the Levellers. Richard Rumbold uh, was later executed himself in, in Edinburgh. And um, on his scaffold, for a plot against Charles II, actually, and on his scaffold, um, his last words, were these. He said that no man comes into the world with a saddle on his back and no man booted and spurred to ride him. And funnily enough, he got that phrase uh, from John Harris, the other man on the scaffold in 1649, who was the editor of a leveller paper directed at the rank and file of the new model army called Mercurius Militaris, or the Army Scout. And that was where that expression, no man comes into the world with a saddle on his back, no man booted and spurred to ride him, first occurred. It later occurred in the diary of Thomas Jefferson, 
uh, one of the heroes of the American Revolution, one of the founding fathers of America, one of the first presidents of the United States. One of the last entries in his diary was that very same phrase. And indeed, the Jefferson family was uh, remotely related to John Lilburn, the leader of the, the Levelers. In every generation in the Jefferson family, there was always a male child whose middle name was Lilburn. Um, the estate in the South of America was called Edge Hill after the uh, first main battle of the English Civil War. And so that's one indication of the way in which the ideas of the Leveller movement um, found an echo first in the American Revolution and uh, then later in the, the French Revolution and indeed in all, in all subsequent uh, revolutions. Um, until fairly recently when uh, Jared Wynne Stanley's hometown of Wigan elected a memorial to him. The only memorial to Jared Wood Stanley was in Moscow, erected during the um, Russian, uh, Russian Revolution. So you can see some of the ways in which the very powerful waves of influence from England in 1649 uh, traveled the globe and, and were reincarnated and remembered in subsequent revolutionary experiences, as indeed as indeed they should be, because um, it wasn't just the execution of a king and the declaration of a republic, um, which were very powerful firsts, or if not firsts, um, highly original uh, political acts. Uh, the Leveller movement itself was described by Marx and Engels as the first communist party, perhaps an exaggeration, but certainly one of the first politically organized movements, its own program, the agreement of the people, the first ever attempt at a written constitution in, uh, in this country. Um, their papers, uh, their subscriptions, their meeting places in taverns, their use of petitions, their organization of demonstrations are things which from that time to this day are the standard operating procedure of any radical movement. They weren't then though, those were inventions. Those were new things uh, to do. To print a petition um, which said um, on the bottom of it um, that the subscribers should assemble in Covent Garden and march to Westminster where this petition will be presented to the MPs, that was a first. A petition up until that point hadn't been a way of publicly organizing support, let alone of demonstrating support. It had been a, a, a pleading document, a document offered um, from lower orders or from contemporaries to um, governments, local and national, pleading for redress. It wasn't meant to be a program of action. In fact, the the moderate parliamentarians and the cavaliers alike complained that these weren't really petitions. They were demands. Uh, they were being offered not in a in a supplicatory way, but in a in a in a, a constitution writing way, and that this was um, not acceptable in the politics uh, in the politics of the day. Even less acceptable, of course, um, as the English Revolution became the English Civil War, as armies were formed, as the New Model Army emerged as the, the key organized political force of the parliamentary side, uh, you certainly weren't meant to go around petitioning um, army units, causing them to mutiny. Um, when the uh, moderate parliamentarians attempted to disband the New Model Army at the end of the Civil War, either disband the regiments or send them to Ireland uh, to fight a war of conquest. And those regiments mutinied. They elected agitators. The word originates here. Uh, didn't mean quite what it means in modern language, although this might be the origin of it, simply meant a representative, an agent. And they elected uh, first in the cavalry, then in the infantry, regiment by regiment, people who were to decide what the army would do, what the army's political demands would be, where it would be stationed, would it march towards the capital, would it invade its own capital to enforce 
its demands and the leaf, uh, leaflets and the petitions and the pamphlets of John Lilburn and the other Leveller leaders, Richard Overton, William Walwyn, were distributed by the agents of the army amongst the rank and file, used to organize that mutiny, used to, term, used to turn the army from a military organization into a political organization. As one of the army's own documents said, we are no mere mercenary army that fights for pay, but called into being by an act of parliament. In other words, we were uh, political in origin and we intend to represent uh, the political views of the ordinary members of the army. And indeed, such a powerful movement was this, that when the parliamentary commissioners came down to the new model army to try and bring the regiments back to obedience, uh, they were driven off by the troopers, shouting at them, what do you mean coming here with your tuppenny pamphlets? by which they meant acts of parliament, um, they seized the king completely beyond the control of their own uh, officers, uh, beyond the control of Sir Thomas Fairfax and the high command. Uh, they seized the king from the control of the conservative parliamentary commissioners. A mere cornet, uh, cornet George Joyce, the lowest rank in the army, um, rode to Holmby House in the East Midlands and seized the king and took him into the control of the army. And when he arrived, the king, Charles I, said to Joyce, where is your commission? In other words, where is the act of parliament? Where is your written authority for doing this, for taking me? And uh, Joyce said, we want to avoid a second civil war. And Charles said, actually reasonably enough, that's not a commission, where is your commission? And eventually uh, Joyce turned and pointed behind him to the 500 armed mounted troopers behind him and said, there is my commission. And Charles, to be fair, said, it's as well a written commission as I've ever seen. And they took control of the entire destiny of the revolution at that point. And those troopers were inspired by um, the pamphlets of uh, the levelers. Um, Richard Baxter, a, a, a moderate, um, preacher on the parliamentarian side went down uh, to Colonel Wally's regiment and horrified said I found the troopers there some preaching church democracy some preaching state democracy some preaching both um, and uh, the, the levelers were at the heart of this by this stage they had uh, a weekly paper uh, called the moderate um, one of the great misnomers in uh, journalism from from this day to that to realize at the time you can go into the British Library and see the original copy of the moderate where one reader has amended it by putting a little arrow uh, before the word moderate and inserting the letters I M so that it reads the immoderate and then another little arrow after the word moderate um, and uh, inserting the word scoundrel so that it reads the immoderate scoundrel which is probably closer to the content of the paper than the original than the original title but the levelers had two of these papers the moderate and john harris's uh, the army scout mercurius uh, militaris um their leaflets this is in a society which had five million people where the uh, walled city of london had three hundred and forty five thousand people only compared to its nine million uh, today uh, these were pamphlets that would be run off in thousands and thousands of copies, petitions that claimed a hundred thousand uh, signatures. That would be a petition with millions of names on, uh, millions of names on by today's uh, standards. They had uh, supporters in the gathered churches. They had itinerary uh, preachers who would take their pamphlets around the country. They could call in meetings. John Lilburn famously speaking in Wapping. Uh, said that soldiers were distributing thousands of copies of the petitions in the regiments of the new uh, of the new model army. So this is a substantial political movement, uh, feared by the moderates on their own side, ridiculed and hated by the cavaliers and the royalists on the other side, and at the decisive uh, moment, actually capable of altering the course of politics. Not on in the uh, on their own in alliance with some of the more radical of the 
um, Republican um, independents, as they were called, the grouping around Oliver Cromwell, but at the crucial moment when the senior officers of the new model army were frozen in a kind of paralysis, unable uh, to come to terms with the fact that they would have to deal with the king. Uh, it was an alliance of the most radical of the parliamentarians around Oliver Cromwell and the leveller movement, which pushed through the decisive moment where the king, uh, where the moderates were purged from parliament in Pride's Purge, where uh, the court to try the king uh, was set up, uh, where the House of Lords uh, was abolished. Steve's quite right to say that the the act that abolished it um, said that it was uh, useless and dangerous. Henry Martin, the Leveller ally, was on his feet in the Commons moving an amendment to that which said that the House of Lords was useless but not really dangerous, um, which might be true now but certainly wasn't then. Uh, Martin, was, Martin was one of the great wits of the, of the English uh, Revolution. Um, he was seen by one of the moderate parliamentarians to be uh, falling asleep on the benches of the of the commons a tradition of course which is uh, well represented today by um, modern mps and this enemy of martin's was on his feet moving a resolution that said that the uh, the noddies um the should be put out in other words the mps that were falling asleep should be kicked out of the commons but martin wasn't quite as asleep as he looked and he was on his feet moving an amendment saying that the nodders the boars that put them to sleep should be thrown out of the uh, of of the commons of course john Lilburn, um a ferocious uh, a debater and uh, and polemicist but also uh, uh, quite a witty man in his own his own right when he was put on trial by the cromwellians uh, shortly after the uh, republic was declared um, uh, he was refused leave to go from the courtroom uh, to take a piss, so he demanded that a chamber pot uh, be brought into the courtroom and relieved himself in front of uh, hundreds uh, in the audience and the entire bench of judges that was there uh, to, to try him. So perhaps in some of these things you see the kind of iconoclastic um, drive, the energy of the movement which shaped the outcome of the English Revolution, which made sure that it did become a republic, if only for if only for a decade or so. Um, and I think it's right um, that we look on this as the birth of political organisation, of modern political organisation, the way in which it worked, uh, the groups of supporters organised by a newspaper, um, relating to those around them with petitions and with leaflets distributed throughout the city of London and throughout the army and the gathered uh, and the gathered churches. These are recognizable forms of political activity, perhaps uh, more recognizable in the age of the internet than before. Um, certainly, I think the levelers would have recognized the way in which number 10 has set up a, a petitioning website where you can put your petition up and if you get 100,000 signatures, um, it's recommended and I think the levelers would have recognized this as too, recommended, but not mandatory, of course, that it be debated by the House of Commons. There were many uh, leveler petitions that were turned aside by the sergeant at arms, burnt by the common hangman as scandalous uh, petitions. Perhaps they don't burn them anymore, but you don't get the answer from the MPs, certainly any more now than you did in uh, 1645 or 40. Six. So this is a movement of uh, a minority, certainly, but um, of a considerable and influential minority. Um, both its enemies and its allies realised that it was a movement of real force, expressing a real current of opinion, capable of shaping opinion, capable of mobilising the population, and ultimately capable at the decisive moment of adding crucial weight uh, to those who didn't want to, as one petition from a regiment in the New Model Army put it, to re-enthrone uh, Charles uh, I. Uh, plenty of people, even on the parliamentarian side, did want to do that. Couldn't imagine a society 
without a king. Couldn't imagine the threat to property that might emerge uh, if uh, such a republic took place. Now, ultimately, they were exaggerating the fears, uh, but it still took an enormous act of popular mobilization, a uh, breakthrough intellectually and politically in theory and organization uh, to get there. And that's what the, the levelers uh, were. Uh, they were a new form of popular political organization, um, demonstrating the ability to write and popularize a new political program, to mobilize masses uh, behind them and to change uh, the course of history. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it's a, a very uh, inspiring introduction, and um, I'm sure it's one that uh, you know we've all learned a lot from. Particularly the, um, the you know the connections with the uh, later revolutionary movements. Um, just as a little bit, bit of a plug for next week, we've actually got a speaker from the United States talking about revolution from below, and that's the the American revolutionary or the popular revolutionary tradition. Um, uh, in, in that revolution, one I think which we can all uh, learn from. Um, okay, comrades, what I'm now going to do is open it up for discussion and comments uh, from the floor. Now, the first uh, comrade who wants to come in is Pauline Fraser. So I'll just to uh, get Pauline to come in. Okay, Pauline, can you hear? Yeah. Okay, just put your question there. I'll make it comment, thanks. All right, okay. <laughs> Shall I start? Yes, please, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Um, all right, start my video, there we go. Start my video. And I'm looking for my comments because I can't, um, I'm trying to, f ah, no. I'm trying to find my uh, chat somewhere. Where is it, q and I can't find it. Um, no, well, I can't find my actual in, in question, chat, if you just, but... If you just scroll up a little bit in the chat, it's there. Uh, it was, your question was about the class forces behind the 1649 revolution. Chat, found it. Chat, found chat. Lovely. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks both to most speakers for, you know, wonderfully, you know, reminding us what fantastic revolutionary ideas there were in the 17th century and what a tragedy it was that uh, they didn't see succeed at that time but I would point to the fact that um, this was basically a bourgeois revolution as, as I understand it led primarily by the big forces of the very rich um, City of London merchants and so on, and with uh, the um, the artisans and the apprentices who um, serviced the um, the organisation, if you like, of the city. Um, but they were not, in the Marxist sense at that time, an actual proletariat. They weren't a working class in the sense that we understand it and this to my mind was a bourgeois revolution that was a very long it was a very long revolution and it went from sort of 1649 uh, when you had the counter-revolution against the levelers through to uh, the so-called glorious revolution uh, of 1688 and, and beyond uh, but clearly a lot of the ideas, as, as John particularly pointed out, have continued and continue um, to this day. Um, and thankfully that they do. So I'd like some comments about that as to uh, whether it, the, either of the speakers think that it could have succeeded as a socialist revolution at the time, or whether it was in fact almost doomed to, to fail, but that it would see a bourgeois revolution um, created. Thank you. Okay, thanks Pauline. Uh, what I'll do is take a couple of uh, comments and questions, comrades, so give you a bit of a rest and uh, you know a chance to link the things together. Okay, the next comrade who wants to come on is uh, Ken Syme. 
So is there there, Ken? Can you hear me, Kevin? Yeah, you're through. Thank you, Kevin. And my thanks to both speakers for a, a very interesting discussion. My question really relates to the extent to which the levelers used any actual biblical texts in their attempts to persuade or recruit people. Most of their pamphlets have a variety of religious references, but it's not obvious to what extent they used specific biblical texts, for instance, some quotes from the New Testament um, to persuade or recruit people to their cause. So I'd be interested in the, pan the um, speaker's views on that question. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Matthew Jones, I think you had a question as well. Yeah, right, thanks. Okay, sorry, Matthew. Yeah, yeah I, 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 am I okay now? You can hear yeah, me. you're fine, yeah. Great, right, okay. No, it was good introductions. I, I enjoyed those. And I think that it's, it's interesting, of course, this in that, you know, it's always good to remind both people and, and of course, the ruling class itself that one, the current order of things is not permanent. It is actually quite temporary in terms of the span of uh, human history. Uh, and, and, and two, it's involved, you know, the, 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 the rising of, the, of the, uh, the current order itself involved the overthrow of the old order, you know, and, 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 and revolutions, as we, as we said, you know, a series of revolutions for the, for the, for the capitalist class to establish itself. And I just, what I was interested in is, is how the how presenters see this in, 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 in class terms. I mean, we don't see in England, you know, the full, or, or indeed, Scotland and elsewhere, the full sort of rising of, 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 of a, an industrial capital until later, um, you know, how, how, you know, in terms of how, you know, the, 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 the different classes are, ex, are expressed in, in, in this um, uprising in, in, in the 1640s. And of course, it's also said that, you know, that many of the, of course, the, the principal um, forces of the of parliamentarism in many in many cases the, the yeoman farmers of course were themselves wiped out socially within within a few a few decades and in fact didn't benefit from it, the whole business at all very much at all uh, so interesting to see you know how, how how people think you know that those forces you know obviously coming together on the basis of the collapse of the old feudal system which is evident over the over the previous couple of hundred years how that, that evolves through um, the, the, the revolution and then subsequently. Thanks. Okay, okay thanks, uh, Matthew. Um, um, Dave Hill now, please, if, if I can get Dave to come in. Yes. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Um, unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're okay, okay. Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What I'm interested in is um, one aspect is the uh, international significance. Now, John talked about the impact, a little bit of the, about the impact on the United States. Um, we know from the Russian Revolution that a that, um, hundred years later, people are still referring to the texts, to what Trotsky wrote, Lenin wrote, blah, 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 etc. Et For how long were people other than a few select academics and uh, perhaps a very few revolutionaries. Um, did people, uh, for how long did people refer to what James Lilburn was writing and talking about and Gerard Wynne Stanley? The, for ex I'll just give one example, the Babeuf plot, the Babouvists in the French Revolution. Did they actually make any um, specific uh, reference to um, the levelers? Um, we're very impressed by them now, and I, I love their. My, my daughters buy me books on the levelers. I love it, um, but I'm wondering about the, how long their actual um, influence lasted internationally. Okay, that's it. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, I've got a, a question. I'm going to use up my position uh, for a second. It's a brief question. Um, 
I'm interested in the position that the levelers took um, on Ireland and in particular their um, uh, op opposition to being sent to Ireland and um, I, I want to know the sort of basis on which this was, was done. Um, there's, there's some debate for example whether the, the so-called mutiny was over the question of payment uh, and terms and conditions or whether in fact it was uh, you know a form of internationalism you know the argument that they were not a mercenary army going into Ireland to suppress uh, other people. Um, I mean this is a particularly um, a thorny question in the sense that the, the, uh, the, the royalist army royalist armies in Ireland and indeed the Catholic rising in Ireland was obviously counter-revolutionary and um, so you know, merely wanting to go into Ireland to suppress the counter-revolution doesn't necessarily make you anti-Irish. Uh, indeed, um, you might even argue if we were going to play some sort of game of historical consequences that um, all really good Irish Republicans would have been on the side of Cromwell and not on the side of the Royalists, but uh, we'll leave that one for another time. Um, Okay, so th that's really the question to, to both Steve and to, to John. Um, I think I've always been interested in that particular question. Okay, are there any f uh, further comrades who want to come into this round at all? I don't see any hands up. Okay, uh, so I wonder if, um, if Steve and John would like to come in. I'll call Steve first of all, if you'd like to respond to any of the questions. Got them mute. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, you're clear yeah. now. I'm, yeah, I'm unmuting myself. And as I go to unmute myself, somebody else unmutes me and I get remuted. <laughs> <laughs> I get, yeah. get muted up again. So anyway. Yeah, I must say, um, I'd, I'd prefer to be with some level of petitions. You can't always mute them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry, go on. Um, I mean, this is obviously before the working class. It was before socialism. It wasn't possible to imagine you could have a modern socialist society. That was never going to be possible. So I, I, I think that's, I think if one connects socialism with the ideas of capitalism, the development of a working class, then obviously this is before that. But obviously it was a, um, well, I suppose, I mean, it was a revolution between different parts, originally between different parts of the of the bourgeois of the aristoc aristocracy, really between the parliamentarian and the royalist part of the aristocracy. But then, of course, it spread down into into other parts of society, who were then drawn into the split within the ruling class. But there must have been absolute limits on what could have been achieved at that time. But that's not to say. I mean, you cannot you you can't really play. Well, what would have, what could have happened? You know, what could it have done? I don't think necessarily it reached as far as it necessarily had to have gone. It could have gone further. There could have been more democracy. It's not impossible that those forces could have won, but they didn't. I mean, that's all we know. They didn't win. They they were defeated. So, you know, I I think that's where you have to be. I don't think you can say, well, what what could have been, what was, but it was never going to be a socialist revolution as we understand it. It couldn't have been that. But it may have, may have been able to achieve more democracy, perhaps, than, than, than it did in the end, because it didn't really do that. It, it turned into a dictatorship. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, Dave asked a question about uh, international significance, which John talked about, I think, already about in terms of America. There was a kind of, and I don't know much about this, but there was a whole revolutionary situation, I think, in Europe in 1648. And there was subsequently, I think, in France, in part of France, I think Sa Edward Saxby went there, so ten maybe a little bit later, there was a republic, I think, in Burgundy or uh, that area of France. There was, a, there was another spin-off, I think, from, from the English Republic. So it, it, it wasn't an, a national thing. It did have international ramifications, even at that time, even in, in 1649, as well as these longer ones in terms of America. I don't have more details of that, but probably John tell us more about that. But Saxby certainly went there, he was sent there by Cromwell, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and on Ireland, John, uh, on the Kevin, sorry, I, I think it was, uh, my impression was it always, it was both. There was, uh, there was a genuine, there was a, a concern about payment. There was, a, there was an economic issue going on there. But I think there was also clearly a political issue going on. 
and that they, they didn't want to be used as a mercenary army to suppress their fellow mm. other other religious other religions, even if they, they were you know, even if they didn't agree with Catholicism, they didn't think it was right to go there and oppress poor Catholic people. And you're probably right that in a sense uh, the English Republic was probably a progressive force, but then Cromwell has a very bad reputation for the way in which the Catholic people of Ireland were suppressed and, and, and by them. Now, there's an argument goes on today about how, how much that was true or not, but certainly in Ireland, you've got Cromwell and, and what Cromwell did in Ireland has left a very, a very bad, bitter reputation in Ireland. Um, again, you know, so I think that that's, I think Burford was about, I, I do think Burford was about Ireland, but it would probably bring in a lot of different grievances together. The mutiny at Burford was ref, refusal to go to Ireland, but yeah. Okay, John. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with the um, Matthew and, and Pauline and, uh, and, uh, and the points that, that uh, Steve just made. Um, this was long before there was, there were people working for wages. A smaller proportion of the society than than is true today, but they were in no conceivable sense uh, uh, an organised, um, even urbanised um, uh, collective uh, capable of constructing or being the social basis for the construction of a of a, of a different kind of society. This this was a revolution against the old feudal order which brought into being the capitalist society which created eventually the modern working class so we're you know we're um a revolution behind uh the thought that there could be a, a kind of organized working class so yes this was uh this was a bourgeois revolution this was people who um were um as the phrase in the day had it and i think it's one of the strongest ways in which you can as a historian access the mindset of people this was the middling sort uh, this was people in trade uh, this were these were merchants these were artisans at the lower end of it and by and almost overwhelmingly the levelers were the smaller artisans smaller masters um, uh, and therefore the most radical of the people in the parliamentarian side compared with the larger merchants or some of the gentry Cromwell course from that uh, social layer um, that led the parliamentarian side, even led the revolutionary part of the parliamentarian side, never mind about the people who wanted to compromise with the king part of the parliamentarian uh, side. So yeah, I agree with all the, all the points that are made, are made there. Um, and uh, the specific contribution of the levelers was that they were revolutionary bourgeois Democrats. That's what they, uh, that's what they aimed at. Um, and the, the interesting thing, I think you can see the way in which that um, social structure impacts on politics when you compare the, the following of the levelers, which was a mass following, not a majority following, but a mass following, with the following of um, the diggers who did raise the property question uh, albeit in a kind of uh, a rural agricultural way, not an obviously an industrial or even urban way, um, but they were essentially millenarian visionaries uh, with a tiny following. And that's because the idea of common property ownership couldn't possibly get traction, uh, even of a minority movement inside a society structured in the way that England was in the, in the 1640s. Now, you often get people on the left say, well, you know, would you have been a digger? Would you have been a leveller? We don't have to choose. <laughs> the whole point about the existence of a modern working class is that it can produce a movement which is both leveller and digger, which both aims at democracy and common ownership. Uh, we are all in the, mod in the modern left, um, inheritors of leveller organisation and ideas and of digger ideas. Um, so I think that's probably the, the best way to look at uh, to look at that issue. It's a question about you're muted. 
said that the host muted me, which I don't know whether that's a kind of signal you're saying. No, not at all. <laughs> or not. <laughs> or not. No, go back. Sorry. I've often thought it's the great virtue of Zoom meetings that the chair can do that. But um, anyway, <laughs> um, just the, the religious ideas were the lingua franca uh, of the age. Everybody talked in uh, religious terms. And so, of course, uh, the levelers did as well. Uh, the interesting thing is less that they talked in religious terms because the kind of the answer to that is yes, of course they did. Everybody did. Um, it's the way in which religion gets used by different social groups. You know, if you're a wealthy landowner, I'm sure that the the parable of the talents appeals to you. Uh, if you're a, a leveller artisan or a demonstration outside Westminster, I'm sure that the text that says that it's uh, easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven is the text that appeals to you. And it's the selection of which texts meaning what um, that, uh, that is the interesting question, not the fact that they used religious ideas, which of course they did. So when the women levelers were protesting, of course, uh, they referenced in their pamphlets and texts all the heroic women figures who'd cut off the heads of kings in the Bible. That was the way in which the the Bible served their political and social understa understanding. So that's, you know, this is the kind of work that Christopher Hill did in his book on the Bible. That seems to me to be the, the sensible and interesting way uh, to do, uh, to do uh, this. Um, Ireland there's a spectrum uh, of, of positions among the radicals. So Henry Martin, who I've mentioned before, writes an in-principle um, pamphlet saying, why, uh, why should we treat the Irish as the royalists wish to treat us? That's unacceptable. There's a marvellous pamphlet which comes out of uh, a level of support of John Cobbett, uh, printed in Bristol which has got an in principle position against, uh, against sending troops uh, to Ireland. But for some of the reasons that Kevin said, and some others, um, that wasn't certainly a universal, probably not a majority position. The thing about the uh, revolt in the army was they were less concerned with whether they were being disbanded and sent home in England or sent to Ireland. What they didn't like was that the effective political weapon in the hands of parliament the new model army was being destroyed by moderate parliamentarians who wanted to do a deal with the king so fundamentally what they were revolting about was the ability to keep the army together as a militant political organization which could stop the reenthronement of the king and so really ireland or not was a secondary question to them and, and rightly I, I would say the primary thing was to stop um, the royalists uh, winning even though they'd lost the war winning the political battle even though they'd lost uh, they'd lost the war um, I think the final thing that I was being asked about was the the kind of political impact the historical impact of the levelers and I'd say the important thing here is that all radical traditions are intermittently transmitted historically. You know, when you're talking about ruling class uh, political traditions, they're institutionalized. They're institutionalized in uh, the um, state, they're institutionalized in the education system, they're institutionalized in the press, they're institutionalized in the heritage industry. They have a massive continuous structure which conveys the Battle of Waterloo, Trafalgar, Nelson, Clive of India, on and on and on, you know, the uh, Second World War until you're absolutely sick of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, of course, on our side, we don't have that. We have a much more intermittent way. And what tends to happen is that after an explosion has taken place, the tradition which it then embodies disappears underground and it's rediscovered when there's another later explosion of radicalism and they begin to find their way back to their forebears. And I think that's definitely happened to the, 
to the levellers. But it was real, real enough. Uh, John Wilkes, the great parliamentary reformer, owned original pamphlets by John Lilburn. Um, Henry Vincent, the great Chartist leader, lectured on Oliver Cromwell and the English Revolution in New York. Um, the Chartists discussed the levellers in their newspapers. Um, uh, I've said about the Russian uh, Revolution, they were fascinated by, uh, by Milton. Lunacharsky, the Commissariat of the Enlightenment, wrote a play about the English, uh, about the English uh, Revolution. Christopher Hill himself learnt from the historians, the Russian historians, even under Stalinism, who wrote masses uh, you know, Hill lived in Moscow for six months, studied the Russian historians of the of, of the revolution. So yes, it can be traced, uh, but it's a it's a it's a work of art uh, to to do it because it disappears underground. It gets transmitted in strange and 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 unusual ways. In during the American Revolution of 1776, women in the backwoods of America were christening their firstborn son Oliver in memory of Oliver, of Oliver Cromwell. So th these things are there, but it's the serious work of, his, of a historian to uncover their transmission and to find out how they informed later, later movements. Okay, thanks, John. Um, I've got a couple of uh, uh, questions now, um, just to follow on there. Um, okay, Crispin, would you like to ask your question? Hi, hi, John. Uh, hi. So you, um, just, uh, I'm quite interested in William um, Tyndale's translation of the Bible in, I think it was 1520 something. Uh, he was executed for it, um, and it had it gave the establishment a lot of fear that he translated it. Um, I heard your answer about how people use the Bible for their own purposes, but. Um, if he hadn't translated that the Bible, do you think some of the ideas, especially the Sermon on the Mount and those parts of the New Testament, do you think that if they hadn't been translated, then there may not have been a kind of movement at all? Or was it not as significant as that? Okay, thanks, Crispin. Um, Liz, uh, Liz Shirley's uh, typed question in. She says, um, what about the references to the position of women in society by the levelers? Are there any? And um, you know, the nature of their ideas, uh, you know, were there a specific sort of women's uh, set of demands? Uh, you, you've already referred, I think, to that in reference to the religious ideas, but I think Liz would, would like to know more about the role of, of women uh, in, in, in that movement. Um, a couple of other uh, a couple of other questions that have come in, um, or comments actually. Um, Steve O'Neill comments that he visited um, the site of a, of a massacre uh, in Ireland, and I suppose the the reference there is to the sort of historical memory uh, of that. Um, and certainly, I think uh, John's response on that point about how Ireland might be viewed in relation to the English Revolution. Um, there. Um, there's also a, a question uh, from Jules Price, which is about, she's talking about peasant or talking about peasant movements. And uh, I suppose this is really in re re relationship to the Russian Revolution. But I suppose there's a question there on the nature of the, of the sort of, of the army and in particular, the reference to the troopers who uh, own their own horses and therefore are slightly above just uh, mere foot soldiers and would represent that middling sort that, that John refers to uh, uh, before as well. Um, okay. Um, okay, I've got uh, two more um, uh, two more speakers, I think. Now. Mark Metcalf, if you'd like to come in, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I thought both speakers were excellent. I certainly can't any, add anything which would be uh, superior uh, to the things that were said. That was said. Uh, just like to say 
when people say it's hidden, I think it's therefore essential that uh, the uh, festival, which is held in Wigan on the first Saturday in September each year now, is as widely supported as possible. Uh, from a few hundred attending, I think the first one was in 2013 or 14, to you know, a few thousand, five, six thousand has come, is an indication that it's popular. It's good fun and it, it gets over the ideas uh, very well. There's a good range of speakers. And obviously the um, memorial thing that has been put up, which is a fantastic size, uh, does great justice uh, to Gerard Wynne Stanley. And I think those sorts of events are so essential. Uh, so just like to appeal to people, if they do, when it comes back on, to try and uh, get along to it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, I've got a, another question which came in um, in the typing, and this is um, from Tony Banks. And Tony was asking about the relationship between the levellers and the diggers, which I know that uh, uh, John has touched on, but I wondered if he could perhaps develop it. And also an interesting question, did the diggers happen because the levellers failed? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. And then um, I'm just going to put on... Uh, Pauline Fraser, who uh, wants uh, another question or another comment. Okay, Pauline, on you go. Okay, uh, thanks to let me have another bite of the cherry. I think actually John has covered quite a lot of the points I was going to raise, which were basically about the, uh, the huge influence of religion, because this was in the middle of the Reformation. And I would have thought that in fact, that had a lot of bearing on uh, Cromwell's attitude to and his behaviour uh, in his leadership in, in Ireland of the army um, because he was fighting Catholics and uh, I, as I understand it he wrestled with his conscience all the time he was always asking God what you know what he ought to do and was he actually doing the right thing by God and so on and so forth and I imagine this was something very common to many many uh, people and of course the whole thing about translating the Bible into um, vernacular languages across Europe was um, central to the Reformation as well and central to the uh, without that I'm quite sure Crispin's right that without that you wouldn't have been have got the uh, enormous understanding that there was amongst uh, uh, ordinary people um, that we've been hearing about from John of uh, of the Bible and being able to quote uh, particular parables or particular aspects of the Bible. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got a, a few more comments just coming in um, on um, on the type sections. And um, this Shirley comment, she says that um, it's possibly putting the cart before the horse to say that the Bible references were used to give weight people's concerns. To underlie what someone just said, did not people's religious convictions and readings of the Bible give them courage and insight to rebel? Which I think is a, you know, it's quite an interesting point there. Um, uh, uh, quite a long comment from uh, Mary Lynham, so uh, I'll read, well, I will read it out. She says, um, she says it's quite interesting about this uh, profound desire from below was for human equality and justice regardless of whether there were the social forces to bring it about at that time and also she says and i think this is very very um important perhaps also that we stand on the shoulders of giants and it goes to show that consciousness which reflects the necessity arising uh from material conditions does not strictly depend on those uh, does not strictly de depend on those material, con material conditions, I presume, and can even shape the material conditions. So she's saying proof is the influence of the levellers in all the subsequent revolutions. Um, and she says she didn't have enough preparation to ask the question, but I think it's quite an important question uh, and comment uh, that she's made there. Okay, um, are there any, uh, any further questions before I uh, ask uh, John and Steve to sum up? Um, I think uh, you know, we've had some very interesting questions so far, but if there are any further comments? 
Um, okay, I'm just check. Okay then, so I'll I'll, um, I'll ask Steve to sum up, and then uh, then John can round it off at the end. Then, okay, off you go, Steve. I, I was going to just comment on one or two of the questions that came up. Oh, one was from yeah, Crispin. yeah, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. One was from Crispin about uh, William Tyndale, and I do think it it was very important getting the Bible in English. It, it democratized the Bible. It opened it up, and I don't know whether the 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 Congregationalists and all the different people who preached in the army of the Civil War and all the rest of it would have, would have been able to do that without the democratizing the Bible. But that wouldn't have stopped a revolution if, if it wasn't in English. It would have been some other thing. We, the, the what if question, what would have happened if we hadn't done that? I don't know. But what we can say is that the democratizing of the Bible opened it up to all sorts of people reading it, interpreting it and thinking it meant something different to what the what the official, relig official religion said. So I think it's an important point. Um, Levelers and women, I can't say much about that, but the, the one thing I would mention, it always struck me, there was a demonstration of 800 women outside Parliament, around about, I don't know the exact date off the top of my head, around about March or April 1649, led by Elizabeth Lilburn in green dresses, in sea green dresses, which was the levelers colour, colours, and they were protesting about the arrest of the four leveler leaders. So there clearly was a, a strong uh, women's organization going on in this. And they were, I mean, the idea that women were out on the street demonstrating en masse, 800 of them, I think is something most people don't know about. It's worth, worth mm. looking into, you know, because I, I do do that. Um, Cromwell, well, I guess, I mean, the point about Cromwell in Ireland was that Cromwell had become the Stalin of the revolution, if we want to put it like that. Mm -hmm. So obviously it's a different kind of Cromwell than the other Cromwell that we had earlier on. Um, at one point, there was democracy in the army. John talked about the agitators. It was a kind of dual power almost in, within the army at one point. Um, and then that, that was lost. All that was lost. And therefore, you got the reassertion. And that's what Berth was, reassertion of a top-down authority in the army. And then it made it an imperialist army that could go to, go to Ireland and do what Cromwell wanted it to do. So I think it, it's shaped by the internal struggle within the new model army and the defeat of the levellers as well as all part of, that, of, of, of doing that. To Mark, I quite agree. I've been to Wigan. It's fantastic that the, the people in Wigan have done that. There's also a Burford demonstration, a Burford um, mm. um, celebrations, let's call that. Burford celebrations uh, that Tony Ben used to speak at. I've been to those and met John there sometime. We were speaking there one time, or John was speaking there one time, I remember, not that long ago. And another one that's come up is the Peterloo one that happened recently to celebrate the 1819 Peterloo celebrate, sorry, to, to commemorate the Peterloo Massacre. So there are these points around which are important culturally and politically for reviving all these things and reminding ordinary people what is our real history? What was Peterloo about? What was Burford about? What was Wigan about? And all those things. And those are the things that take this from just pure politics into the realm of culture. And I think republicanism is a culture and attitude and value. So I think those events are very important. But the, the, the real thing is because it was a defeat. And that's why I say we were defeated. That it went underground, and therefore you have to you have to dig out that that stray that strain of republicanism that actually goes right the way through our politics. But it's hidden. It's underground. It's it's not official. Um, it's the uh, what do they call it? The um, yeah, yeah. Okay, I forgot what they call it. So <laughs> I want to try to remember that one. Um, what else um, about Everard? Well, Everard was a leveller and he was an agitator as well. So he was one of the shop stewards. And so he was, although he went away, he, he split away from, uh, from uh, Wynne Stanley. So there was a clearly direct connection between the levellers in the army and the diggers. But I don't think it was the defeat of the levellers that led to the diggers. I think it was the other way around. I think it was the success of the levellers and the revolution early on that allowed, the, that was my point, allowed the diggers to, to come out and do what they were doing and get away with it for a certain period of time because the authority, the Republic opened up that possible space. Therefore, it was the defeat of the levellers that meant at the end of the day, the diggers were finished. They wouldn't survive. So I think if the levellers opened the way to the diggers, and the, and the diggers wouldn't survive the defeat of the levellers. That would, they would all be lost in the counter-revolution that took place in, during 1649. Um, 
what do I want to say? My last point, I suppose, is this number one. Number one thing is it's not just history. It's, a, it, it's great history and it's, it's very interesting. But I do believe it's relevant to where we are today. And just as Johnson said at the beginning, I quoted him saying it all goes back 300 years. That's his story. That's the story of English nationalism. That Churchill goes you'll go right way back to, to where Johnson said we on our side of this thing. We as a, as a progressive movement, we have to go back to 1649. And that is something we have to popularize amongst the left because we've talked a lot about the Russian revolution, but very little about the English revolution. But Trotsky, of course, in his writings on Britain was very, very clear on this. He, he advised us to go back to Cromwell, well, Cromwell, that the English revolution was absolutely crucial for a revolutionary movement in this country. And Trotsky was right about that. We, we, we need to know about the Russian Revolution, but we really do need to know about the English Revolution. So, you know, go back and look at that. Because it's not just history, it's, a, it's a learning the lessons for today, I believe. And it will be relevant in the next period where we're facing politically in this country. Okay, thanks, Steve. Okay, John, if you'd like to round up now. Yeah, well, let me respond to, um, uh, to some of the questions. Uh, just a... I've spoken a little bit about Ireland, but just uh, one more word on, on this, really. Um, I'm always surprised when people think that there's a contradiction between the Cromwell who fought against Charles I and the Cromwell who invaded Ireland. There isn't. It's a bourgeois revolution. What do you expect from a bourgeois revolution? Democracy at home and colonialism abroad. That's what they do. It's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a contradiction. It's what a bourgeois revolution you would expect it to do. And, it, uh, and they were pretty thorough. Um, it wasn't just Ireland. Uh, the first major sort of foreign policy project of the Cromwellian regime was the so-called Western design to capture the, uh, to the West Indies. Um, when they went to war with a European power at first, they didn't go to war with one of the kind of um, monarchies or absolutisms of Europe. Uh, they went to war with the Dutch, which was the only other republic in the world. So you've got two capitalist republics fighting the first war. Now that's, that's, you know, capitalism's about competition. If you didn't learn it from Marx, you must have learned it from Margaret Thatcher. That's how it works. Um, and so there's not, that, that's what you would expect to happen. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, con it's not a contradiction. Um, with the women, it's all the same story really. It's, it's how you cite this properly historically. Um, now, um, a word about the 17th century family. The 17th century family, you know, we sometimes use the term patriarchy to describe women's oppression or sexism in the modern world. But patriarchy was a much heavier stone uh, under which women uh, labored in the 17th century. The family was not only the key unit of reproduction, it was the key unit of production. In the uh, artisans or in the master's house, that was both the place of business and the place of domestic residence. It wasn't just where the blood relatives of the master lived, his wife and children, but where the apprentices worked. So patriarchy was control of the productive machinery of the society and the family institution at the same time. And it was universally accepted that the male head of the household represented everybody, women, children, apprentices, politically, legally, and so forth, and so on. So there was no talk of, when we talk about um, levelers demanding the vote, they were demanding uh, at their strongest universal male suffrage. They weren't advocating uh, votes for women. But the turmoil of the movement was so great that women began to play a very prominent role as activists. Indeed, sometimes in gathered churches as preachers, which drove the moderate uh, religious figures and the cavaliers absolutely nuts that what they called mechanic preachers and mm. women preachers would be allowed to the pulpit, would be allowed to preach to the, to the congregation. And that boiled over into women's activism. So the demonstration that, uh, that Steve was talking about, um, organized by Elizabeth Lilburn, 
and uh, by a remarkable level of le leader called Catherine Chidley, um, who wrote in her own name, wrote religious pamphlets, uh, disputatious religious pamphlets in her own name, which was absolutely unheard of. Women didn't write, they didn't put their name to it, and they didn't contest religious authority. And she did all three plus was a leveller organiser. And when the women protested about the arrest of the four leveller leaders, some of the MPs came out and said, it's very odd to see women protesting. And the women replied, well, it's very odd that you cut off the king's head, but no doubt you'll justify it. <laughs> um, so that dynamic was happening, but not in formal programmatic political demands in terms of women participating as activists. That's where that point of origin is in the, in the uh, it's a fantastic story, the, the, um, the mobilization of, of women. And uh, they, at the height, they had a woman representative for each ward or were trying to get a woman representative for each ward of the city of London to carry out petitioning and getting <coughs> names and so forth and so on. Um, one more word on the uh, on the Bible. I think Crispin and uh, and others who've who pointed out to the uh, the, the English language uh, Bible very very uh, important indeed. As of course was the fact that you know the Church of England had broken with Rome. Uh, that um, there's been the Reformation in this country. The whole Puritan movement, um, of which the Levellers were very definitely a radical part, was about how reformed should the English church be? Should it just be independent of Rome, but essentially have the same hierarchy of bishops and archbishops and uh, sort of rule from the court? Or should it be an almost flat um, organizational structure in which the local congregations controlled who the preacher was, what they preached, um, and so on and so forth? So <coughs> that was a critical a critical question and the ability what the what the what the bible in english gave people was the ability to have a direct relationship with god through god's word without it being mediated by the priest the bishop or the archbishop and so it democratized or had a democratic impulse in the religious <coughs> in the religious world and of course um that had all sorts of impacts i mean one of the reasons that we know about the Putney debates, of course, is that the secretary to the army took the Putney debates down in shorthand. Where did shorthand come from? It came from the Puritan gathered churches because it was very important to understand what the preacher had said and to discuss what the sermon had been afterwards. So the Puritans invented shorthand to take down the sermons and discuss them later. And that spilt over into the diarists and uh, the record keepers of the English, of the English, uh, uh, of the English uh, Revolution. Um, finally, on the diggers, um, uh, the, the, the diggers were one of uh, an explosion of small radical sects after the execution of the king. So it's the diggers, the ranters, the fifth monarchists, the Muggletonians. Uh, the Quakers, uh, the biggest of them all, probably the Quakers, and probably the longest continuous radical religious organization in this country. I mean, how many left-wing meetings have you been to that were still held in friends' meeting mm. houses? It's a quite remarkable uh, line of radical dissenting religion from uh, the English, uh, from, uh, the English uh, Revolution. Um, but it was, that, it was that unprecedented moment and here I go back to the, the introduction that I gave, of doing something absolutely historically unique, shatteringly unique, executing uh, the king, turning the world upside down. If that was possible, why not common ownership? If that was possible, why not, as the fifth monarchist thought, that there would be a second coming of Jesus within our lifetimes? Why not a thousand, you know, why not sexual liberation as the Ranters thought? The whole world was suddenly exploded open by the Revolutionary Act of 1649. My interest in the Levellers is that they were part of the process of making that revolution. The Diggers and the other sects were ideological after effects mm. 
of that yeah. of that revolution. Absolutely fascinating, mm. but there's a. If I had to choose, I'd say let's look at the people who made the revolution, um, and then we can perhaps see some important things about making <coughs> uh, making our own. After all, what what are we really saying here? About mm. it? aren't we really saying that um, people excluded from power in any society? Um, they obviously don't have money and wealth. They don't have arms. Uh, they don't have the apparatus of the education system or the church at their disposal. They really only have two things. They have numbers. There's more of us than there is of them. And they have organization. And what the levelers tells you is even the numbers aren't any good without the organization. And if that isn't an enduring lesson for the left, I really don't know what is. Okay, thank you very much, John and Steve. Um, I, I think everyone will agree it's been a very good session, uh, very, uh, very interesting. And I think it's given us uh, plenty uh, of ideas to go away and uh, pursue. Uh, just on that point, uh, we are planning uh, three sessions on the English Revolution and culminating with the discussion on 1688. Um, that will probably take place a little later in the autumn and uh, I'll send out more details about that when, uh, when we've uh, finally confirmed it. Um, and also uh, a, a reminder that next week's uh, session is on the American Revolution and uh, that, that continuity that uh, John referred to in reference to Jefferson and indeed the, the whole idea of revolutionaries learning from each other and in a sense generalizing their experiences. And I hope that's what we've uh, done something of tonight. Just a, a final comment. I first came in touch with the Levelers um, as a schoolboy when um, I was very lucky to have a, a special exam a section called the English Revolution. And I actually had to read a lot of those texts. It was in the era of uh, Christopher Hill and Brian Manning. So um, I didn't do anything about Clive of India but I certainly did a lot on John Lilburn and Jared Wynne Stanley, and it's uh, it stuck with me. But uh, John's revived my interest in it tonight, and Steve, who I've met in other instances, talks about the relevance of those ideas, um, you know, in contemporary politics, and I'm, I'm sure he's correct on that. So uh, I've had a really had a really good evening. My apologies for the technical problems at the beginning, but uh, I hope, as they say, that didn't spoil your enjoyment of this session. So um, uh, good luck and uh, look on the website for some uh, suggested readings for both this session, for next week's session and for my session on the, the, the peasant movements. So thank you everybody and a big round of applause for our two speakers. Thank you.